chance to have a, uh, some kind of look around the exhibition, but you'll have more chance later on. And then we'll come back here after that for discussion and questions, primarily for questions from you uh, to, to us. So that's how we'll run it. And uh, my name is Philip Ball. Uh, I'm a science writer. And let's see if I can get this first. There we go. Um, and I'm joined by, and this is the order that we'll talk in, I'll say a few words to begin with, and then Anais Tondeur, who's a visual artist and has one of the uh, exhibits, a couple actually, of the exhibits in this, uh, in this exhibition. We'll talk about some of, that, uh, some of her work. Um, and then um, Aravind Vijaya uh, Raghavan, is that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, from the, uh, who is a material scientist from the University of Manchester and has uh, being responsible for setting up the, some of the microscopes that you'll see at the top where you can, you can inspect some of the gra uh, graphite-like materials that we'll be talking about. Um, and then Alexandra Porter, who's a material scientist at Imperial College um, and works on uh, other um, graphitic materials, um, particularly from a, a medical point of view. So. Uh, with that introduction, I want to just uh, begin by saying that I think it's rather wonderful that we have um, uh, a materials theme exhibition like this, um, and it's, it's, I think it's particularly nice in the sense that there is, of course, a big materials themed exhibition in town at the Royal Academy, all about bronze, uh, whereas this one, I think, is far less obvious. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not, I, know, I think a lot of people would find it uh, not at all obvious that there would be a lot to say in an artistic context about graphite, but I think you, hopefully you would have already seen that there's plenty to say about that. What I wanted to, to uh, just point out first of all is that actually I think that carbon, which is what graphite uh, consists of, the element carbon, that it's one of a, a tiny select group of elements 
that can claim to have something of a mythical status. Um, and here are some of the others. Um, gold and silver coinage metals, I, I think uh, this, this could be said of. And also, if we're talking in the sort of classical sense of what is an element, then water also has this, uh, th this status, in the sense that there are very deep cultural associations that we have with these materials. They're not just chemical elements, if you like. Um, and I think we're all familiar, in terms of carbon, we're all familiar with the idea that uh, carbon is associated with life, that we are uh, carbon-based life forms. And that's why the chemistry of carbon compounds is referred to as organic chemistry. But I came across a rather more stark um, indication of the sort of um, even bizarre indication of the the associations culturally that we have with carbon and its centrality in our physical selves. If you can't see from the back there, this is a, a website where you can get the ashes of your cremated loved one turned into a diamond. Um, and diamond and graphite are often, they're, they're both forms of carbon and they're often called the, the carbon cousins because they're, they're both pure carbon and they can be interconverted one to another. In fact, the first time diamonds were made artificially, and this was something that as soon as the chemical relationship between graphite and diamond was discovered, this was something that people were understandably very keen to try to do. It wasn't achieved until the 1950s, and um, the, the, it, was, it was done by squeezing graphite to tremendous pressures and at high temperatures in this huge press at the General Electric labs in Schenectady. And um, this was essentially mimicking the conditions in the deep earth under which natural diamonds are formed from carbon-rich materials. And I think it's really often diamond itself that, um, that, that stands for the mythical uh, aspects of carbon. I think that this is what tends to sort of crop up when we see these cultural associations of, 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 of carbon, associations of, of purity and of clarity and of eternity, um, which seem in some ways to be the antithesis of the, the soft, dirty, black stuff that graphite is. But carbon and graphite also show that while atoms are, in everyday terms, immutable, the elemental embodiments of uh, those atoms aren't. That actually there are um, several elements that can exist in quite different material forms, and here are just some of them. And uh, carbon and graphite are like this as well. We tend to associate chemical elements with specific qualities, with specific appearances and materials properties. But it really depends, those properties depend on how the atoms are joined together. And that's the key distinction between graphite and diamond. Um, and what we find in that case, I hope you can see this uh, behind my head, is that in, graph in, in, that in diamond, the carbon atoms are joined each to four neighbors in a kind of tetrahedral arrangement. Whereas in graphite, each carbon atom has only three neighbors, joined in hexagonal rings that are joined edge to edge and formed into these separate sheets, individual sheets. And there's no strong chemical bonds between the sheets, and so they can slide over one another. And this is what gives graphite its soft and slippery appearance. And it's what makes it useful as a, as a lubricant. I actually brought along a, a little, there's, there is plenty of graphite around here, but you can do feel free to just sort of dig your hands into this bag of powdered graphite too, because, you know, I think one of the key uh, aspects of graphite is that it's such a tactile substance. Actually, do you, well, you pass it around. And, you will get very, very, you'll get it, everywhere. It does get, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe <laughs> leave the bag sealed for the, for the time being. In fact, I, I, yeah, I did, it, it, it did start leaking. Everywhere. Uh, it will. That but it's, carbon black. But it's cool. lovely to put your hands into it. It's not actually carbon yeah. black. No, um, carbon black is... Um, uh, an amorphous, uh, so it's not a, it doesn't have this sort of regularity of structure, this crystalline structure. It's much more disorderly in the way the, the, the atoms are arranged. Um, but um, it, this, this kind of uh, bonding pattern in graphite is also, it's what gives it this blackish appearance. It's what allows it to absorb most of the light that falls on it in the visible part of the spectrum. 
Um, it also accounts for why graphite slightly conducts electricity, and that's important technologically. Um, and it's what gives graphite this sort of uh, silvery metallic sheen. Now, graphite's actually a very old substance. It's old technologically in terms of the uses we've made of it, and also it's old ge geologically, very old. Um, since around at least the 4th century BC, uh, the 4th millennium BC, it was being used technologically to decorate ceramics, to decorate pottery. Um, the fact that it's soft and that it's slidey means that it was used as a lubricant for casting cannonballs in the, uh, fr from the sort of late Middle Ages and the, the, um, the Elizabethan age. And in fact, that's why it, it began to be mined uh, around this time, certainly from around the, the 16th century. At that time, it was known as plumbago because of, its, uh, because of its, the similarity of its appearance with, with lead. And, but of course, it was um, its use in <coughs> pencils that it's, it, the, for which we, we, we sort of tend to associate it now. And that's um, really what gave graphite its modern name, uh, because that, that refers to the Greek word for writing. It also makes, this softness makes graphite actually a rather beautiful sculptural material, and it has occasionally been used for sculpture. It's not very durable, of course, so it's not ideal in that respect, but you can, you know, uh, uh, carve things into it. Now, this long history of, uh, of, of uh, human use of graphite makes it perhaps surprising that only recently has graphite-like carbon become such a technologically exciting material, and that's what Aravind and Alex will uh, tell you a little bit about. And I should say, by graphite-like carbon, what I mean is carbon that is joined also in the, uh, that is basically formed from this motif of a hexagonal ring of, of carbon atoms. And um, chemists had learned, known for a long time that you can get small molecules with this motif in them, and in fact the smallest uh, just has each of the atoms capped with hydrogen, and it's the molecule benzene. And it's been long known that um, you can also have larger molecules like this, that are like little, essentially like little fragments, tiny little fragments of graphite-like um, carbon. And you know, the, these are some of them that, that occur in, in nature, in oils. Chemists actually are now getting very adept at making these sorts of things synthetically. But in 1985, it was found that um, if graphite is heated up electrically so that it starts to evaporate, then the fragments of carbon that come off can condense into molecules that are rather like closed shells of graphite-like carbon. And this is what they look like. Um, and you, see, you might be able to make out here that actually in order to get the, that curvature, in order to close the shell up, you have to have some pentagonal rings as well as hexagonal ones. In fact, you have to have precisely 12 pentagons in a structure like this, no matter how big it is. 12 pentagons will enable it to close up entirely and make a closed cage. And these molecules became known as fullerenes, and the one I've shown here is the most symmetrical of them. It's made of precisely 60 carbon atoms. And um, six years after the discovery of this molecule, it was found similar experiments on evaporated graphite, electrically evaporated graphite, produced a different kind of sort of closed shell structure, which was a tubular form, like a kind of tubular um, sheet of, of, of graphite that tended to have sort of rounded end caps, a bit like a test tube. And um, these were called carbon nanotubes because the, these little tubes are just a, a few nanometers in width, and that's a few millionth of, uh, of a millimeter. And they, um, the first ones to be found were actually, they weren't these single shells, they were sort of um, nested concentric tubes like this, this is a cross-section of them, and you can actually strip away um, some of these tubes and get these sort of telescopic-like structures from these multi-walled nanotubes, but it became possible later on to just make them with a single wall. And these are technologically interesting for various reasons, they're very strong and stiff, they're, and so they're, they're like sort of the ultimate carbon fiber, really. And um, they can be used as nanotechnological girders to build with. They also conduct electricity, um, so that makes them potentially useful as tiny little wires for making small electronic circuits. And um, Alexandra will say some more later about their uses and about their hazards. 
And the more scientists began to explore the chemistry of this graphite-like carbon, the more they began to appreciate the amazing diversity of structures that these sheets of carbon can be fashioned into. And here are uh, just some of the many structures that can be found. Some of them actually are just theoretical. This carbon nanofoam is, it is but uh, many of them have been found experimentally. Um, this kind of origami with these graphite-like sheets takes us all the way from uh, all the way uh, from things like fullerenes to conventional carbon fibers which are basically a sort of disorderly form of these graphite-like sheets with some chemical links between the sheets and the latest of the uh, the hottest of these uh, graphitic materials is this one over here just individual sheets of, of graphite if you like called graphene and that's what Arabin will tell you more about very shortly and I think there seems to be a, a sort of pleasing symmetry in the way that graphite, which was named originally for its ability to make marks on paper, now is turning out to be a kind of paper, if you like, that can be um, uh, used for, that can be manipulated in many ways, that can be bent and folded and cut and pasted. And we'll hear about uh, some more about how that can be done shortly. But first of all, I want to, to hand over here to Anais. Who, whose work, I think, has explored some of the deeper cultural resonances that graphite possesses and the way in which it emerges as a natural resource, both pregnant with artistic potential and connected to our planet's ancient past. So with that, I'll hand over to Anais. presentation on one of the two projects that I'm showing in this exhibition. It's, and I'm going to tell you about how I've engaged with graphite as an artistic medium, but also how I've explored its nature as a geological material. So for this, I'm going to tell you about this installation, which is composed of 44 drawings realized during an expedition that I did over the summer. The expedition started in the, the pathology collection of St. Bartholomew's Hospital with this specimen. So what you see here is a lead of graphite, which ended up in the bladder of a young girl of 17 years old at the beginning of the 20th century. And around the bladder, there was a deposit of calcium that layered up so much that it filled the whole bladder. So she was the surgeon from Belvin managed to extract this foreign body and this specimen is now standing on the shelf of the pathology collection for almost a century now. So the intent of my work was to unravel the story of this piece of graphite and travel to the major places of its formation and transformation. So I went all the way from London to the southern French Alps, then to the Rhone Alps regions, then to Paris, then back to London. For this, for this expedition, I was guided by two ge geoscientists. My father, who is uh, in fact a geophysicist and a mountaineer, uh, and in fact he learned, um, he became a high mountain guide in this part of the Alps. And then we also had some advice from Raymond Listonel, who is a specialist in history, in the history and geology of this region. And he did uh, indicators, um, places where we could find traces of the formation of this graphite. Uh, and then places um, like, for example, this house, which is a, an old mining house. And then we also told us about places where not to go. <laughs> mm, and so in fact on each site I started the production of the drawings and created six series of drawings, so one series per, per site. And the drawings, I've been realizing them only with graphite but using the different variety uh, of graphite from really dry, thin uh, lathes to really bold graphite and then also smudging the graphite or mixing it with a uh, linen oil. <coughs> so the first trip was um, in the southern Alps, uh, above Briançon at 1473 meter high. Um, and so on the Carboniferous site and in fact the trip to this site allowed me to travel back 
to the time of the formation of this piece of graphite, the graphite that is in the pathology specimen. Um, and in fact, go back some 300 million years ago at the moment where the graphite started to fall. So we went on to those uh, coal bearing landscape where some old, like some 300 million years ago, a forest would have started to die, create an organic residue, and then form carbon. So we looked for some traces of that forest and we find some fossilized traces <laughs> of, of this time. So, for example, a, a petrified tree branch and massive uh, tree trunk, and then also textures um, of organic textures. So, for example, here, that would have been a spores of a fern. And here, fossilized uh, stems from a horse tail. So from there, we uh, walked up at 2,800 meters uh, to look for the result of a contact metamorphism. So in fact, we were looking for graphite veins. And because in fact, during the formation, during the creation of the halves, the carbon, which was certainly subject to high temperature and uh, high pressure, transformed partly into graphite. So that's why we can find some graphite uh, in, in the halves. And so after a 12 hours walk, we started to see some of those horizontal lines of the graphite vein, and we moved closer to them. Here you see a detail with the graphite infiltrating into the rocks. In another part, we could walk directly on the graphite vein, and by following it, we managed to reach the entrance of a graphite mine. So it was exactly at the same altitude, and getting inside of this mine was quite magical because you had the feeling that people had just left the place uh, a few days before uh, because it was difficult to carry all the equipment at 3,000 meter high that they just left everything when the mine stopped. In fact, the production uh, lasted around 40 years. It stopped working in 1932 and the peak of the production was around the First World War when in fact, the major supplier of graphite in France uh, were the Austrian and the German, so obviously the French couldn't uh, get graphite from them anymore, so they, so they had to find a source of graphite directly on their territory. And because all those materials were left outside, it could give us clues to follow the journey. And what you see here, uh, is a hydraulic tube that was used to transport, carry in fact the extracted graphite down into the valley. So we followed those tubes and reached the factory. So just in Briançon. And it's a factory that was used to treat and transform graphite into powder. So now we don't see much uh, of this factory anymore. It's a sort of ring that is surrounded by walls. So I could just have a few glimpses of the space through uh, holes in walls. And then from there I travelled to Conte Pencil Factory. Um, Conte in 1792 form, I mean, created a, a new form of pencil because beforehand uh, French people were mainly using pencils from England but because it's the Napoleonian Wars we, can't, we couldn't import any more product to France. <laughs> so uh, Conte was kind of like ordered to invent a new form of pencil. And what he added to the English pencil is that he combined graphite powder to clay. So this could give the whole variety of graphite layers from really dry to really bold. So in there, I managed to get inside of the factory uh, and there were still a few, mach a few machines uh, left. And the final step of the journey was in Paris, in the saint denis shop, which opened at the end of the 19th century, and which is the shop which uh, sold Conte pencil uh, since the beginning. Uh, and nothing has really much changed into this shop. You still find uh, 
um, the wooden case. And what is really interesting is that they've kept a really detailed list of all their clients, and especially at the beginning of the 20th century. So I could access those lists and find the name of a certain Edgar Amflet, who was a correspondent for the Times in Paris at the beginning of the First World War. And in their list, I could read that he bought some pencils. And a few months afterwards, his daughter swallowed one. So, Aravind, change of gear. Yes, so let's talk some science. <coughs> That's the tagline for my talk, and I've been using this around the country for a couple of years now. Unexpected science in a pencil line. Oh. Yeah, just move it. Oh, it's all right. I can. Sorry. I can. Just That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name. So the, the thing I want to convey to you first of all is everything. We, when you look at graphite, uh, or diamond, or carbon black was mentioned, these are all three-dimensional allotropes of carbon. Allotrope, as like, uh, was mentioned before, there are different forms of materials, and they're called allotropes. When you talk about carbon, there are three-dimensional allotropes of carbon, which is diamond, graphite, and carbon black. But now, um, in the era of nanotechnology, we are discovering and exploring what are essentially the lower dimensional <coughs> allotropes of carbon, or lower dimensional allotropes of a variety of different materials. So 3D up here, that's, that's graphite. And then the two dimensional version of graphite, if you wish, is graphene, which is what I'll be talking about. The one dimensional version of graphene, uh, of graphite, is the carbon nanotube, which was previously mentioned, which Alex will be talking about. And the zero-dimensional version of, of graphite is the fullerene, which Philip mentioned earlier. So how do, you, how do you understand this? What do you mean by lower dimensions? So if you look at, that's a sheet of graphene. You've been introduced to the structure of graphene previously in terms of how the carbon atoms are arranged. Now, you have to believe me when I say this, but if you, I'm not sure how clear it is, but do you see the shape that I've marked in green on that graphite lattice? If you cut the graphite in that shape, you can actually physically roll it up and connect all these atoms and form a sphere. So technically, you can get a spherical object, uh, that, which is the carbon-60, which uh, was alluded to previously. You can cut it in a special way, and you can actually spread it out into a flat sheet. So in fact, the spherical object is a version of the flat sheet. And if you take this flat sheet and you stack it up, you get graphite. So technically, you can get the fullerene directly from graphite. Similarly, if you start with graphite, and you extract the single layer, which is the two-dimensional plane, and you roll it up into a tube, you get, you get a tube which is one-dimensional. Whereas the fullerene, which is known as formerly known as buckyballs, is uh, zero-dimensional. It's, you know, it's, it's a dot versus a line versus a sheet versus something that's 3D. So we're now, technologically speaking, uh, the physics, if you wish, of um, lower-dimensional materials is very different. The properties depend very strongly on the dimensions. So if you take a zero-dimensional material, the physics, the equations that describe a zero-dimensional material is very different from the equations that describe the electronic properties of a one-dimensional material, which is in turn very different from the equations that describe the electronic properties of a two-dimensional material, which in turn is different from a 3D material. So we're now entering an era where we're looking more and more seriously into what are regarded as lower dimensional materials and nanotechnology is the broad umbrella <coughs> under which these low dimensional materials are studied. So how do you make graphene? And this is, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting story and I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you that. 
Um, graphene has existed literally on paper uh, in two ways. When you write with a pencil, you form you, the, the layers of graphite that is being passed around will, because the, the layers of graphite can slide on top of each other. When you write with a pencil, essentially what you're doing is producing graphene. You just can't, you just don't realize you're doing that, but that's essentially what you're doing. So when you write on a piece of paper, graphene exists on that piece of paper. But graphene has also existed on paper in another sense. The equations that describe graphene were written down about 50 years ago on paper, because back in the day they didn't have computers. So they wrote down the equations that describe graphene because you needed the equations that describe graphene in order to derive the equations that describe graphite. And why did we need the equations to describe graphite? Because graphite is engineering, uh, from an engineering perspective, a very important material. It's, graphite is not just limited to pencils. Graphite has an important, a critical role to play in the nuclear energy industry. Every nuclear reactor has got loads of graphite in it. So in order to study the properties of graphite, people needed to write down the equations governing the properties of graphite. And in order to do that, you had to literally write down, with graphene, the equations that govern the properties of graphene. So in that sense, graphene has existed for a long time. So what was the problem? I mean, why did, why did the, you know, the, the, we, we all say that graphene was isolated or made in 2004, which is not technically true because graphene may have been made before every time you write with a pencil, except nobody could find it. So you needed sophisticated techniques to find the graphene to prove that you've actually made it. So the way we, the way we made graphene and the way the University of Manchester scientists made graphene for the first time was very simple, very elegant. You take a piece of graphite, which is, think of it like a deck of cards, and if you think of graphite like a deck of cards with layers, you keep cutting the deck, ultimately you'll end up with one card. And how do you cut a deck of graphene, which is graphite? You put the graphite between two pieces of sellotape, stick the two pieces of sellotape together and peel them apart. Half the layers are going to stick on one side and half the layers are going to stick on the other side. And then you put them back together and peel it apart again. Every time you do this, you keep making the graphite thinner and thinner and thinner. Ultimately, you make it so thin that you end up with a single layer of graphite, which is graphene. So this became known in the scientific community as the scotch tape method, <laughs> or, or the sellotape method, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from. Um, that is the scientific term, by the way. You can find that in scientific papers in nature. You can vouch for that. <laughs> so it's called the scotch tape, or the sellotape method. And that's what graphene looks like. Uh, what, what you're seeing here, uh, I'm not sure if it is particularly clear to the people in the back, but is so the purple uh, you see in the background is the sample on which, uh, on, or the substrate on which you put the graphene. The slightly darker shade of purple you see there is single layer graphene. So I want you to just reflect for a second on this because that is a single layer of atoms. It's the thinnest possible material in the world. You can't possibly make anything thinner and yet you're able to see it using your eyes. You, you don't need a sophisticated electron microscope. I told you previously that people had trouble finding graphene. They didn't know how to look for it. But here I'm showing you a picture of graphene where you can actually see it. And if you go upstairs and take a look at the two microscopes that I have set up upstairs, for yourself, you can look through the microscope, an optical microscope that anybody can find in a school physics or chemistry lab. You can see graphene, the thinnest material in the world. So the understanding of what you had to do to see this was a very important contribution. And it basically, it depends on the surface that you put it on. So what I have here are three pictures of graphene taken on different types of surfaces using different colors of light. So, you know, the, the illumination, the color of light, the way you perceive graphene, uh, or, or any material, it's, it's not just an artistic thing. I mean, artists obsess about lighting. So do scientists. You know, we, we go into the lab and, you know, we, if you don't have the correct color of light, you can't see the graphene. 
So this is equally important in science. It's not just an artistic thing. So this, I love to show this picture because what I do a lot is I go to science festivals around the country or I go to science museums around the country and I try to explain to people that science is not something that's difficult. Everybody can do science. And I describe to you how you can use a piece of sellotape to make graphene. And this is a picture of a seven or eight year old girl using sellotape to make graphene. And she was having a ball. She was, you know, making her graphene, putting it under the microscope, taking a look at it. It was fantastic. So we get very young kids, kids seven, eight years old, all the way up to pensioners coming to our science festival exhibits and making graphene. So it's something that everybody can get in, engaged and everybody can appreciate. That is a picture of graphene under an electron microscope, under a transmission electron microscope, where you can literally see the individual carbon atoms on graphene. So every white dot here is an individual atom of carbon that is taken using an electron microscope. Um, and you see a little black triangular shape right in the middle. That's a region where one carbon atom has gone missing. So the lattice, the structure of graphene is not perfect. When we draw it on, you know, using computer graphics, you draw this perfect lattice, but it's not perfect. Every so often you see missing carbon atoms. And, you know, these, these sort of imperfections, in a sense, um, exist all over the place. And some people might view that artistically. You know, I don't know. It's up to you. Um, anyway, the, the two guys that figured all of this out about graphene, understood it, measured its properties, showed the world how to make graphene and what it's all about, are Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselo from the University of Manchester. And a couple of years ago, they won the Nobel Prize for their work. Interestingly enough, I want to go back to this slide. Um, science, I keep telling you, this is not just serious stuff. There's a lot of play involved in science as well, a lot of fun. Andre Geim is notorious for being the only person in the world to have won the Nobel Prize and the Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, for those who don't know what the Ig Nobel Prize is, it's the prize for funny science. Um, and he won this prize back in 2000 for making a frog fly. So what he did was he took a frog and he put it inside a really massive magnet. And the magnet made the frog levitate. And there's the video uh, roaming around the internet on YouTube, if you Google flying frog. It's the first thing that turns up. And he won the Ig Nobel Prize for this. But it was a serious scientific paper. It demonstrated for the first time that you can use the principle of diamagnetic levitation to float objects, including living objects. Scientifically, that is a very, very important discovery. But the way he presented it was, you know, using humor. And that's why he got that prize. The frog was OK. <laughs> he, he actually likes to joke that health and safety wouldn't allow him to put a student in there. <laughs> um, but these days, you know, when, when we use, when we make graphene with the sellotape method, it's, you know, you make very, very small pieces of graphene. It's not scalable. People are always asking, so, great, it, you know, it's got amazing properties, but how are you going to use it if it's, you know, so hard to make? So, I mean, there are other ways of making graphene, and one of the ways of making graphene on a large scale is chemical vapor deposition. I'm not going to go into it, I'm not going to bore you with it, I'm just telling you that such a thing exists. You can actually use this technique to make large sheets of graphene. That's a 30-inch sheet of graphene. Why would you want to make a large sheet of graphene like that? I'll give you a clue. The guys that sponsored this work was Samsung. So they're trying to use graphene as a conductive coating for their touchscreen displays and TVs and you know things like so that's one of the potential applications of graphene and we're hoping that within a few years graphene will find a place commercially in touchscreen technology for example another area where graphene uh, research is very active in is um, energy so things like energy conversion so solar cells photovoltaics photo detectors, sensors, etc. So here are some artistic impressions, what we call artist impressions, you know, um, which is basically uh, geometric scientific drawings of uh, what the various different kinds of graphene-based solar cells might look like in the future. Uh, so where does all this magic happen at the University of Manchester? Where do we make and study our graphene? 
We have to keep the environment that we make our graphene in very, very, poor, very pure. So in a sense, we work in areas known as clean rooms, where you have to gown up completely from head to toe. The air is always constantly purified. The temperature is constantly controlled. The humidity is constantly controlled. Everybody's, you know, gloves and face masks and all that stuff. And we work in, in a clean environment like this in order to get the best scientific results uh, of our measurements on graphene. And as you can see, the other important thing I would like to emphasize here is that it's a very interdisciplinary effort. We have people from all different fields of science coming together, working together, and that's the way modern science is evolving. There's very few things which is purely physics or purely chemistry. Everything is interdisciplinary now. And it's also multinational, so we don't restrict ourselves working just within one university. We, work, we have collaborations all over the world. And I just want to finish with this slide, which is a summary of uh, all the academics at the University of Manchester who are involved in graphene research. Yes? using graphene and the carbonaceous uh, nanomaterials. What I'm going to tell you about are more the fears over, over their use um, and how we can actually image these structures in the human body to try and understand whether or not uh, these fears that have been generated are, are real or not. Um, so, you know, billions of pounds, I guess, are being pumped into, or millions of pounds are being pumped into this kind of research. However, there's been great concern um, that these classes of nanomaterials may cause um, um, uh, uh, have an effect on human health. And due to these concerns, there's been kind of hype that's come out in the media over the past few years. Um, there's been press coverage about this, and there's also been headlines such as these that come out uh, where EU ministers are calling for ban on these classes of materials. Um, so the question is, are these concerns real? Are, are, we, is it okay? is, um, are these concerns real? So the kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves is, how could these materials interact with the body? Um, if we can understand that, then we can start to make predictions about whether or not they might cause damage uh, to human health if they, if, um, they uh, came in contact with the body. So the kind of questions that we want to ask us, so if these materials were to become airborne, what would happen? So we would inhale them and they would be able to get into our lungs. Um, so if they got into our lungs, the questions then are, do these materials interact with the cells in our lungs? Could they even cross the cells in our lungs and reach the circulation where they might reach organs within um, our body, other organs within our body? So these are the kind of questions that you need to ask to be able to address whether or not they cause uh, toxicity to the body. Um, so do they cause damage to cells? Are they able to cross cells? Um, do their properties change at the point of exposure? So for example, we generate materials that he's described in the lab, but that's not actually the format that many of these materials will be presented to the body in. Um, so, for example, I've got an example here of some uh, C60 day cream. So this is a cream. Maybe the properties of this material would change uh, in these, in these um, applications, and that may change the way these materials could interact um, with the body. Another question is, so you see the materials in, in, in this format, however, they may be able to degrade. So maybe if they get into the body, they could be broken down by the body, and then the body may be able to deal with them. Um, but to try and address these kind of questions, you need to be able to image these materials inside cells and tissues, and this is non-trivial. Um, first of all, we've got a material that's carbon, and as, as was described previously, these materials um, are one- or two-dimensional materials, and you require a kind of a very high resolution to be able to image these materials inside cells and tissues. So just as an example here, here I've got my sheet of graphene. Um, here I've got my sheet of graphene uh, in an electron microscope. 
very hard to see anything. So there's not much contrast. And here I've got my graphene. And you can see the individual atoms of the graphene. But if you, if you look down here, what kind of spacings am I trying to look at? Well, the distance between these bonds is of the order of about two angstroms. That's uh, 10 to the minus, an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10. So it's really hard to see these inside the cells. Here I've got my cell. How big is the cell in the body? Well, that's 10 mic microns. So that's 10 to the minus 6. In addition, a cell is mainly carbon. So I've got something that's carbon in a cell that's a lot larger than this material, and I'm trying to image it against a carbon background. So this is a, kind of a real challenge for, for imaging. How do you see these materials in cells and tissues? Um, so the way that we do this is to use a range of techniques. Um, so we can use light microscopy techniques, so we can use the optical microscopes that you've seen upstairs, and with these methods you can image yourselves. But you can't actually then see the structure of these materials inside the cells. And for that, what we need is a very powerful electron microscope. And with the electron microscopes, we can actually see uh, this, the kind of the atomic structure of these materials. Using other methods in electron microscopes, we can also map the composition of these materials. And that will tell us um, about, um, for example, the catalyst that's used to grow these materials and its distribution inside the cells. Um, so how do we actually do this in practice? So at Imperial College, what we have is a, an electron microscope called a Titan electron microscope. This is a machine worth about 3.5 million pounds and it's got lots of gadgets on it which allow us to be able to see uh, these carbon rich materials um, in cells and tissues. Um, and why? So it's got lots of gadgets on it um, with lots of different detectors. And so these detectors all allow us to be able to image different features of these um, carbon nanomaterials in cells. So for example, we can look at variations in atomic number. We can look at variations in the way they're bonded the materials, we can generate 3D information, a bit like MRI, but now we can do this in electron microscope. And also we can resolve atoms. How do we do this? So the limitation with um, kind of the older generation of electron microscopes is that the lenses have aberrations, but now they've developed these systems where you can correct these aberrations, so you have near-perfect lenses, and now we're able to actually see atoms um, uh, within materials achieve this near atomic resolution and we can see these structures inside cells. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through is how do we image the different kinds of uh, carbon uh, nanomaterials inside cells. So going from the fullerenes to the linear uh, nanotubes uh, to, to uh, the graphene materials. And need to, if you look at the structure of these materials you can start to make predictions about how they may interact with cells and tissues. You could imagine that they would interact with these with uh, tissues in very different ways. Here I've got a molecule which is about just under one nanometer in diameter. Maybe it can diffuse into tissues. Here I've got a linear material. It could almost spear a material. It's kind of quite a multiple nanotube. It's quite inflexible. It might, it might be able to spear into a cell. And here I've got graphene. Well, no one's really imaged this inside cells, so it's hard yet to make predictions. So I'm going to start with the multiple nanotubes, and then I'm going to work my way down to the graphene. These are the easiest structures to image inside cells. When you get to the fullerenes and graphenes, uh, graphene imaging becomes really quite a challenge because you've got such uh, small materials that you're, you're trying to image. So if we first look at the multiple nanotubes that were described earlier, so these are kind of larger structures, they can be of the order of about now 50 nanometers by about 20 microns. Okay, so nanometers 10 to the minus 9 microns, 10 to the minus 6. And this is what they look like, these kind of very long, in, and they're quite inflexible, uh, these structures. And there's some concern if you look at them, in the microscope, there's some concern that they may have a similar to asbestos. So asbestos, again, is this very high aspect ratio, inflexible structure. 
And what's been shown with asbestos is that it causes a disease called mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lung. And that's thought to be because the asbestos can basically spear through cells. So how do we image these structures inside cells? So what we need to do this is a three-dimensional imaging technique. So we can actually image this process of, of potential spearing of the nanotubes into the cells. And so what we do, instead of just taking one image, we take lots of images at different orientations, that you can see here, different orientations, and then we just back project these images and you can form a, re a reconstruction, a 3D volume reconstruction. And so what do you see when you feed these nanotubes to cells? Um, actually what you see is quite similar to what we thought we might see with the um, asbestos paradigm. So, here are my multiple nanotubes, quite flexible structures. Here's my cell. Uh, this is a 3D tomogram. So here's my cell, this block here. This is my nucleus of the cell where you've got your genetic information. And here, this black structure here is my multiple nanotube. And you can see it is able to spear into the nucleus of the cell and back out again. Um, so that's with the 3D imaging techniques. And we can do something quite similar with light microscopy, where we can stain the cells. Here's my nucleus of the cell, my cytoplasm of the cell. The white structure here is my long multiple nanotube. And again, you can see it's kind of spearing through these cells. However, these are quite long structures. What happens if I shorten the length of these structures? Do I see something similar? And actually, you don't see anything similar to that. So it's not all bad news. If I shorten the length of these multiple nanotubes, you see a very different interaction with the cells. So, if I look here, here's my cell in this image. Here I've got my nucleus of the cell and all the internal cell organelles. These black structures here are short multiple nanotubes. Now you can see that they kind of pierce into the, the outer membrane of the cell. But you're not seeing this, of course, this, this spearing that we saw previously. In addition, when you shorten the length of the tubes, the way that you do this is to use a very strong uh, oxidation treatment, and that actually damages the nanotubes. And so what we've found then, when you expose these to the cells, the structure breaks down entirely. This used to be a multiple nanotube, a fibrous multiple nanotube, but now you can just see these remnants of the tube inside the tissue, and that's implying that it's breaking down in the tissues. So again, what it's telling us is that it's, it's not all bad news, you know, don't believe the hype of the media, that was just one class of tube that we were looking at. For these, they break down, they can get into the cells, and so for this reason they've received some interest in medical applications. Maybe you could use these as a vector to deliver drugs um, into cells and tissues. Okay, so we've looked at the kind of stiff multi-wall nanotubes. Another class of nanotube is just when you have a single wall nanotube, so you just have two walls of a nanotube. So these are structures that are about one nanometer in diameter and they're very long. And because they're so thin, they're very flexible, so they kind of bundle together. They're no longer these stiff, long structures. And so what happens then when you look at them inside the cells? They look, they look very different. <laughs> So here's a 3D volume reconstruction, here's my cell, and here are my nanotubes. They're just bundled within um, kind of a vesicle within, inside the cell. So they're not spearing, they just bundle together because these are very flexible structures. And then what we've done is just to threshold the different intensity levels. And here's this vesicle structure, and here are the, the purple are my bundles of signal nanotubes in the cell. Okay. So these are non-toxic to the cells. Can we then really push up the magnification and see individual single wall nanotubes in the cell? Yeah, we, were, we have been able to do that. This was work actually done at the Dysbury lab. And now you can see in cells, individual single wall nanotubes. These are just one nanometer in diameter here again. Hard to see, but these are now nanotubes. This is my plane going into the plane of the tissue. So you can see 
now individual tubes inside the tissues. Okay. okay, so let's get more difficult. Can we now see C60 molecules inside the tissues? So this is really quite a challenge. Um, but we have been able to do this, although it was difficult, difficult work. So what you see now is that the C60 goes to a completely different site within the cells. What happens is that it just concentrates at the outer membrane of the cell. So when you look at the outer membrane of the cell, bump up your magnification to see the individual C60 molecules, you can see here, you see this lattice of individual C60 molecules, and they're segregating at the outer membrane of the cell. Another thing that happens is that these C60 molecules, as you can see here, they kind of crystallize to form an ordered structure. And so when you look at them in the cells, as you can see over here, here's my cell with its nucleus. Um, the outer membrane of the cell it actually aggregates. They aggregate as, as a crystalline structure um, inside the cells. So again, we can take 3D reconstructions to show that. Okay, so the next question, I was asked to talk about imaging graphene originally inside cells, and, and when I was asked to do this in summer, I had never done this before. <laughs> so we kind of had to set out on a mission to see whether or not we were able to image the graphene um, inside cells. So this is some work that we've, data that we've just got over the last month or so. Um, so what we've done is to expose again graphene to um, two cells in the body, and tried to image the graphene inside the cells. So what happens when we made the graphene, many of the sheets, instead of just seeing a single sheet, a single layer of the graphene, what we, what we found was kind of several, several layers stacked on top of each other. So these are kind of graphene platelets. It's actually quite difficult to get these monolayers. So this is where we started. And here you can see um, inside a cell, and you can see graphene and the sheets in different orientations inside the cells. Again, bump up the magnification, that scale bar's two nanometers there. And we can start to see the individual layers of the graphene inside the cells. So if you, this is the inside the cell, if you follow these lines here, you can see the individual sheets of graphene inside the cell. Okay. So can we see individual layers? We're, we're working on it uh, hard. We haven't got there yet, but what we are able to do is to image inside. So this is a, a vesicle, again, inside the cell, and we're beginning to see just very few layers of the graphene inside the cell. But actually, in this case, unexpectedly, they are actually causing toxicity to the cells, um, which which we're working on to try and understand. We haven't got them yet. That's also, these are the people that have done the work. Some of this imaging is, is quite, quite a challenge to do. Um, so these are, the, these are the four girls who have done this uh, imaging. Okay, if we break for maybe 10 minutes, I think we probably should try and limit it to that, and that will give us some time afterwards to have some questions and discussion before we have to catch up. So, ten minutes. Or so, you can make it. Okay, so we get going uh, the time remaining. Um, I guess, really, I want to throw it over to questions straight away, if you have some. Does anyone have any questions of anyone? Yes, please. Um, I'm a very non-science person, and I was wondering, I know about 3D, I know about 2D, what is 1D and 0D? Right, so, uh, okay, I, I, I have a very good explanation for this. So when you look at the uh, carbon nanotube or the fullery, you know, the, physically, it's a tube, and the tube is three-dimensional. Or, or it's a sphere, it looks like a football, that's three-dimensional. 
So why do I say it's zero dimensional? There are two reasons why I say that. The first is from the perspective of an electron that lives in this material. So electrons, every atom has an electron, um, or has many electrons, and these electrons are responsible for conducting electricity and heat and so on and so forth. As far as the electron is concerned, an electron that lives in a sphere has nowhere to go. It's trapped in that sphere, and therefore it's got zero dimensions to travel in. Whereas an electron that lives in a carbon nanotube can move back and forth. The net displacement of an electron is back and forth. And therefore, it can only move in one dimension. If you take an electron that lives in a sheet, it can only move in two directions, uh, left, right, back and front. And if you write down the equation of how the electron behaves, when it is limited to move in two directions, then what that is known as two-dimensional physics, because the electron does not, there might be a third physical dimension, but the electron cannot travel in that third physical dimension. It is as if you're, if, if you're living in, in Flatland, I don't know if you've read the book, uh, there's a book called Flatland where, where, you, where, where the author imagines what life would be like if the concept of up and down did not exist, everything was in the plane. Um, so that is a two-dimensional world where, the, where you might, there might be an up and down, but you can't move in that direction. So that is one explanation for why I say zero, one, two, because in, from the perspective of the electron it is. The other explanation for dimensionality is in terms of, if you take a sphere and you want to make it bigger, but keep the same, same structure, you can't make it bigger and keep the same structure. If you take a tube, you can make it bigger by adding atoms to the ends, which means you can grow it in one direction. If you grow it in any other direction, its properties will change. But if you grow it in one direction, its properties won't change because the arrangement of atoms around its structure doesn't change. If you take a sheet, you can extend it in two directions and still keep the same structure and keep the same properties. But if you extend it in the third direction, the properties will change. So from that perspective, you describe things as 0, 1, or 2D, or from the perspective of electrons, you can describe it as 0, 1, or 2D. So that's what we mean when we say it's low dimensional materials. Thank you. I always had the image of electrons going in the form of three directions. Um, the idea that electrons are limited by the way that you describe. Yes. Um, it's, it's kind of new to me. I, I mean, I imagine if you, you, you had a you know, electron like football films on the flat plane, yeah. um, but the electrons will spiral. Net, net displacement. They, they might be able to move in the other direction, but yeah. overall they can move, e like, you know, if, if you take an electron in a plane, yeah. it, it can move up and down, right. but that's the, dis the net displacement, if you average out its motion in that direction, yeah. will always be zero. But it can have a net motion in in the third in that plane. Okay. It might be like vibrating along, uh -huh. but the, the, the average displacement in the other direction is zero. I wonder whether you partly mean if you think of an electron in an individual atom, mm. then sure mm. it can you know at that scale mm. it's it's you know mm. taking all sorts of uh, yeah. all sorts of paths, yeah. but it's not going it, it it can't really go sort of beyond that mm. that region. So if you average out its motion over time, you will get a zero net displacement in an atom. The electron is not moving anywhere if you average out the motion over is it time. Running up and down on the spot. Exactly, exactly. Whereas if you have a tube, it's it can move a net displacement, a, a net distance over time in one direction, but in the other two directions, the net displacement averaged out over time is zero. So it's the physical tangibility of... When you measure it, you can't measure it because all measurements are averaged out over time. Yeah. When you make a measurement, you never make a measurement at a single point in time. Uh, uncertainty principle forbids you from doing that. Yeah, Heisenberg. Heisenberg's principle. So when you average it out, when you make any measurement, you average it out over time. And therefore, the average measurement in the other two directions is always zero. Mm -hmm.
Yes. Well, well, he, he's the moderator, so he gets to pick who, who asks the questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, speaking of Heisenberg, you, you, your, your resolutions were, of course, amazing uh, with, with, with electron microscopes. But, um, you know, when you say you're seeing uh, an individual atom, you're really not. You're seeing a blob, right? Because if you really get into the innards of the atom, you rip it apart because uh, your resolution increases with the uh, way you see things increases with the frequency of the, of the incident light. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have very high resolution, very high frequency of light, and you rip the atom apart. So what you're seeing is a, is, is a blob yeah. um, at, e at each corner, symmetrically put. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's basically the, what you're seeing is the probability of the atom being in that position. Mm -hmm. Is what you're actually seeing. Well, it's pretty certain. <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> so, but in, in, that sense, a, it, in, that, in that sense, it is a blob. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, the, the actual size of the atom is not the same as the size of the white sphere you're seeing. Sure. It's just that the interaction volume yeah. between the electron that you're using to image the atom and the atom itself is that sphere. Mm -hmm. So, the atom, the electron you're using to see the atom doesn't necessarily have to hit the atom in order for you to be able no, to see it. Oh, 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 it's an electron microscope. It's an electron microscope. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So the electron you're using to look at the atom yeah. might pass you know, that far away from the atom and you'll still be able to see the existence of the atom. So the white or dark sphere that you see is the interaction volume right. or how, you know, the, the volume in which the electron will feel the atom. That's what you're actually seeing. And then could you ever have uh, uh, asymmetries in, in, in the graphing? Could you have, you know, how would that affect it? What do you mean by asymmetry? Well, um, not exact, um, uh, exact structures. You can, uh, what you can do is pull the graphing in one direction or another direction, and you can stretch the hexagons, and that would dramatically change the properties of graphene. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you introduce a strain into the graphene, it'll change its properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, right at the back. Okay, hi. Um, a question regarding uh, the link between the, the science side and the art side of um, this kind of talk stroke uh, exhibitions. And uh, this kind of goes out to the artists and to the scientists uh, individually. Um, but I was wondering, so what I've kind of noticed so far is a, a kind of more comparison between, uh, regarding graphite, between um, the way artists use graphite and the way science is using graphite and the kind of the link in between kind of seems to be the fact that, the, that it's graphite that people are using. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just my uh, um, uh, Neanderthal way of looking at it. But I was wondering um, if, if there's something that you can see between the, uh, the kind of the bonding between scientists and artists that is more than just having a common ground. Whether, um, because in the exhibition next door we have uh, you know, piece of artworks that are uh, a combination of scientists and artists, and so over here, I was just wondering whether um, you um, you guys have your own projections on what you think scientists and artists can do as a kind of combination, opposed to this is what scientists are doing with the material, this is what artists are doing with the material. That the material is the same, but can artists and scientists kind of do you have an opinion of what scientists and artists have in the future, which is not just comparative, you know, artists illustrating a scientific idea or scientific ideas, um, you know, being shown by artists, you know, or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, question. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's already a, a first step, and for example, from with this exhibition, the installation on the other side, um, Aravind uh, saw the work and then from there we started to discuss of oh we could maybe use some of your research into this performance and you were speaking about uh, graphite graphene based ink that could be used to produce the drawing so to kind of like finish the cycle so I mean it's all just like an introduction for example for me as an artist to see all this new research done with graphite as a material mm -hmm. and knowing more about them and then for sure, in good engaging further. So I think for me, it's more like a first steps. First steps. Yeah. And it's like you know, the Well, I just want to add that it's you know, art is art and science. Are, it's it's interesting because you, when you, what is science? If you look at the if you look at a painting, 
There's a lot of science in there. The colors are chemistry. The interaction of the light with, with the artwork is, is optics. The, um, you know, the, the shapes are is geometry. There's equations that can describe a number of shapes in art. So, you know, if you put a scientist, uh, let him go to work on a piece of art, he can come up with a lot of science in that artwork. Similarly, you take a picture that a scientist produces and you show it to an artist and you might get a completely different interpretation of it than what the scientist or the artist will look at it in a completely different way. So what a gallery like this does is essentially generate that dialogue. And then, what, so it's a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you start generating the dialogue, that leads to more ideas. So yeah. it's, you know, this grows. Cool. So you, so you think there is a, 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 a well, this is a very new, this is a very new concept that the the, the thinking that scientists and, and artists have something in common and that they can actually work together and make something that is appreciated by both scientists and artists, but in different ways. Hmm. Not this not a new concept. It's a very old concept. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, it's new. Well, reinventing it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think reinventing it, but I was interested in Kajar, um, in the neuro, the neuroscientist um, who did those very beautiful drawings um, of uh, the, micro the microscopic uh, levels of the of neurons. Of neurons. And um, he said uh, that he suspected that um, he was, whilst he's making this drawing and in being conscious of other people, artists' work, that not only were artists um, illustrating the particular thing that they were drawing, but revealing in the way that they drew it the very structures of the mind, the physical structures. You get. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the correlation between art, the practice of art, and science is um, much closer. I mean, I mean, what what it was about? I mean, it's about what a human being is and what they're made of, and you know, and, and particularly perception. And uh, we, you know, we were talking about Heisenberg earlier. So I think that you know, there, are, there are many, many levels of intention and cause and effect which are very, very similar. Well, unfortunately, scientists are not allowed to interpret. Our world is fairly black and white. <laughs> well, is that right? I mean, what about the thoughts and experiments? I want to get a few more questions here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, but let's, um, yes, yes, Can I just say also, it, it's sounding to me as though 
drawing and visualization are perhaps the issue that you, uh, you might have been looking for, that are, the connection here with, with the art and science. And it sort of occurs to me that you know, what, what you've seen in the, the presentations that the, the, the scientists uh, have, have given you is what you now get, which is these very sort of smooth, lovely computer graphics and, and so on. And in a way, it's a shame that, you know, 50 years ago, had I been talking about this, I couldn't have done that. I would have had to have drawn on a blackboard what these molecules look like. And that's actually how a lot of chemists, you know, when they're talking to each other and when they're thinking, yeah. they'll think with a pencil particularly chemists, because they have to think about these structures of molecules, and they draw them, and they have shorthand ways of drawing them. Those drawings themselves are, um, are, are interesting in terms of revealing you know, what they're thinking about, how they're thinking spatially. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame that we don't see that. They're increasingly now, we see they you know, then go and use a computer program to make something that look very geometric and perfect. Um, in some ways, you know, too geometric and perfect. Actually, these molecules don't don't look like that. They're they're loose, they're floppy, they're moving about. And in the, it, when when they used to use drawing, when they still do use drawing informally, you have much more of a sense of that. Um, so you know, I, I I think that there's there's a lot of perhaps there's a lot of visualization in science that is becoming increasingly sanitized because we can because we can use computer graphics. Um, and you know, when we go back to people like Cajal, who was drawing, there's actually something there that is much, they're having to think perhaps more explicitly about representation, and how you represent and what you represent. I'm, I'm actually a graphic designer, so that's why I look at these graphics, and it's really, it's really interesting that as a designer you see it, and it doesn't look creative, obviously, but it's got so much potential to be more creative, these sort of presentations of... Well, that, that, that's what I said before, we're not allowed to yeah. be creative. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> even, even, even the colour combinations, the simple, simple tiny details, it's just missing. Oh, well, that's, yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be wrong, it doesn't have to be interpreted, it can, right. still, be, can still be presented in a little bit, yeah, more tactile way, like you say, more yeah. like drawing, maybe it's more, yeah. I'm sorry, go on, Emily. No, I'm just saying, in a sense, the, that, that the uh, scientific community is starting to realize that because more and more scientific papers employ graphic artists, not like we don't generate the images that represent our work ourselves. Every university now has a graphics department which, with professional graphics artists who, do, who develop a lot of these. Um, who develop a lot of these images because we, you know, we are ambitious. We want to get on the cover of the journal. <laughs> so then, then you need to you need to generate a visually appealing image yeah. without compromising or sacrificing the scientific content. So there is there is a tendency towards that definitely. But I think it sometimes sacrifices the artistic content. Possibly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was question. So, well, well, yes. Um, I think there's something that hasn't really been mentioned here, which was brought out actually by Anais's artwork, which was really the, the history as well, and um, how, for instance, you, I was quite struck by your imagery and your exploration that you're sort of delving into, as it were, a history of enlightenment uses of materials, perhaps 18th, 19th century, the significance of the Alps in particular, or mountain areas, as industrial spaces before they became romanticised as places of leisure. And, self-discovery. So I'm just, um, and so I think that's what is highlighted here is the kind of changing meaning of the technologies and you kind of highlight it as it were the irrational underbelly, you know, by this act of ingesting the uh, crayon, the, the pencil. Um, and, and I suppose picking up also on Philip's uh, statement that, you know, we've moved from this kind of rather instrumental use perhaps of, of graphite, you know, in a, in a somewhat ignorant way to we're getting into a much more structural understanding of it and, you know, nano-engineering. So I'm just wondering what, you know, I guess what, what am I trying to say here is that where are we now historically in terms of that, you know, the use of materials, what is that, what kind of cultural paradigm are we entering there um, in terms of that um, engineering that we're now undergoing? I, well, I mean, I, from my point of view, I would say uh, one of the things that is changing is that we have uh, materials used to be used and discovered and created in a very haphazard way, trial and error. 
um, you know, until the, certainly until the middle of the 20th century, that was the case, and a lot of the plastics that started to arise were found that way. Now we're at a stage where we can engineer with atoms and uh, create materials on the drawing board, uh, literally, uh, you know, that, that we'd like them to look this way, we think they will have these properties, and then we'll, you know, go and figure out ways of making them that way, putting every individual atom in, in place. That's, you know, um, Arvin showed, for example, how you, you can make this, this technique of chemical vapor, vapor deposition, where we make layers, um, you know, individual layers of materials, and you can build up, you know, at atomic layer by atomic layer, you can build up very specific patterns of materials. So we have that incredible control now. Um, but uh, Alex, you're also a material scientist. What, what do you feel about where we are with how materials are? <laughs> well, I think the thing is that we're, we're at a stage now where we can, without gloating, one-up nature. Because everything in the past has been, you pick something that nature has made and you study it. But now we've actually reached a stage where we can make things that cannot possibly exist in nature. Is that a good thing? Depends on who you ask. If yeah. you ask a scientist, he'll say that's a very good thing. If you ask a religious person, they'll say you're playing God. It depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. Well, but it's not religious. I'm, saying, I'm just it? saying that it depends that on. That could potentially be a very bad thing. Potentially, it could be a very good thing. It, it depends on the perspective. Yeah. Nature still kind of plays a role as well, doesn't it? Like with your research on whether yeah. Yeah. these yeah. things. Because yeah. certain things, yeah. that's, there's yeah. certain things we make. But I do. I do a lot of research on bone, for example. Mm. These very complex tissues. We're nowhere near being able to engineer these. We're kind of at one scale, but we, we don't even understand how they're made. <laughs> yeah. And nature doesn't just make a material, it can, it, it, repa it repairs its own materials, you know, it, it, it adapts the materials to the changing circumstances, like bone, you know, grows where it's needed, where it gets stressed, gets dissolved away where it doesn't, isn't needed. It has fantastic capabilities like this that we're only just starting to be able to understand, let alone to, to be able to do. Yes. Well, I'm just suddenly struck by the connection between what the two of you have done, which is yeah. this girl swallowed a pencil, <laughs> and here we are looking at what graphene does to lungs. I mean, what an extraordinary juxtaposition of, of the two scales, the two paradigms. Um, it's fantastic. And actually, she's telling me what might happen. <laughs> I'm only just making a prediction for the cell culture dish. Well, it's actually, also, what she's got is more real. You know? Well, it's also a size scale, isn't it? The, yeah. Back in the day, when carbon goes into the human body, it was something that big. Right? But now we're looking at something that's a million times smaller at the cellular level rather than at this level of the whole bladder. But it's the same thing. In, in a sense, it's, it's because they're spearing of the cell. It's exactly the same as the pencil spearing the bladder. And the body deals with it. You, you know, it, it's doing its best to create something soft around this horrible, pokey thing. And, you know, it's, it, the, the, there will be something potentially similar going on. With, well, in fact, that, you know, there is, with, uh, as, as Alex showed, with some of these nanotubes, it's breaking them down. Um, so, you know, the body has its, its defences. I just want to add a devil, devil's advocate question. You talked about engineers. Are they going to be the new third force in terms of deciding what is artistic direction and what is scientific direction? Because you say you can now engineer or design things. Yeah, I'd say it's commercial. Thing. Uh, it's a question. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I um, would love to think that that's going to happen. Um, it, I, I think it's, I've, my experience has been that it's quite hard to get um, scientists to think that way. And I've explicitly tried it with, with, uh, with chemists, with molecules, that actually you can regard, I think you could regard potentially chemistry, building molecules as a plastic art. There's no reason why you can't. We can build with them, we can construct things little objects and you have all sorts of interesting questions about how you then visualize them and display them. You can do that. Um, 
I think so, so far it's quite hard for chemists to get that idea that you can actually create something that is, you know, that has an artistic message rather than something that just looks nice and symmetrical. Um, but I, I'm, I think it ought to happen, and I, I hope it does happen, um, that there is more discussion uh, between, you know, people who are building these things and people who are used to making in an artistic context. Um, it hasn't happened yet, I don't think. Let me let me draw your attention to a paper that was published about ten years ago, and I absolutely love this paper. I don't remember the exact title of the paper, but it goes something along the lines of anthropomorphic molecules. Um, it was a paper by an organic chemistry group, which produced about I don't know twenty or thirty molecules um, that each represented a different human feature or human expression of human form as a stick figure. If you drew the shape of the molecule, it looked like a person smiling or a person wearing a hat, a person holding something up. That was their entire paper. There was nothing else in the paper <laughs> except making molecules that looked like stick figures of people doing stuff. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 I mean, I loved that paper too. The only drawback was that the molecules themselves might not look that way if you actually saw them in the microscope because they're floppy. Whereas, you know, people have done something similar with DNA, that you can program DNA to fold up in specific ways and people have made little smileys out of DNA and, and characters out of DNA that you can see in the microscope and they, they really do look like that. In fact, they made a map of the world as well. And this really showed that, you know, we're at this stage where we can just, and with DNA, I mean, what a resonant thing to do it with, that we can really, you know, mold molecules in this way. And so I think we're really at the point where we could do something actually quite interestingly artistic. Well, I think it's a, it's a minority of scientists who have A, an artistic bent, and B, a sense of humor. Well, but you desperately need that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can distinguish that though between maybe arts and I'm a design student, so there's a very big trend in my design course um, towards science and using science. One of our tutors, I don't know, Tour Van Ballen, he's called, he, um, he actually engineers and pigeons to poo so. So he's, there, there is, there, there is a very big trend towards using nanoscale and design, doing massive design projects that will, that will do it. And I think that's pretty great. And we're talking about this is probably just another sign that it's happening. <laughs> we probably have time for just one more question, and we're going to have to wrap it up. But yes, please. Um, if the exhibition is called Charcoal and Yield, what would the scientific contribution be? To that exhibition, would it be as interesting? Charcoal. Yes, it would be. Absolutely. Because charcoal is another form of carbon. I mean, yeah. when, when, when previously there, there was a mention of soot. Charcoal is soot. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. So, amorphous carbon, the science of amorphous carbon, is a massive science. There's a huge field of study of amorphous carbon. It won't be, I won't be here, because I don't study amorphous carbon, but somebody else will. So yeah, why not? <laughs> it's, it's generally thought that the, probably the first fullerenes ever made, these little ball-like molecules, were made when we made, you know, when we burnt wood and made charcoal. That it, very probably amongst all the stuff that comes off from something combusting like that, there will be some of molecules there. Um, so, you know, they, they, they just turn up. What would you have done, Anais, with charcoal? <laughs> well, I mean, charcoal is another really interesting drawing tool. Yeah. Um, and then the project that I've done with uh, Yannis Landon, who is a physicist and working at the Aircam, was about looking at the vibration inside of a material and how to translate this vibration into a graphic image. So from charcoal, I think there would have been a lot of potential also. I think we're going to have to draw it to a sort of formal close there. We have to be out of this building by nine, but there, that will leave at least a little bit of time if anyone wants to grab anyone else before we, <laughs> we have to, to be booted out. So thank you very much for coming and thanks for everyone.